Um, I was really excited when I woke up this morning and knew I was going to see Judith today. She is just one of my favorite people. Uh, I got to meet her at ATMRD last year and she's just lovely. So I was excited. Um, Judith Sachs is the founder and director of Anyone Can Move, an adaptive movement program in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Although she started her professional life on the stage, she's a dancer, and then moved to the healthcare arena, she now combines these two passions. Her goal is to get everyone moving, whether in a chair or across the floor. Judith is a certified Dance for PD teacher in Philadelphia and a 30-year pr ah, practitioner of Qigong, Push Hands, a practice that maximizes balance and breath. In 2019, she piloted an innovative therapy program, Close Contact for Couples with PD, under a grant from Penn Medicine. In 2020, she was awarded a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence grant to improve partner communication with couples online, and in 2021, was awarded a second year in cooperation with both the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center, Penn Medicine, and the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health at Cleveland Clinic in Las Vegas, Nevada. And 2022, she was awarded a Help Yourself grant from the Parkinson's Foundation, and that is what she's going to be talking about today. So welcome, Judith. We're so glad you're here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for having me today. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to see Eden and Kelly. And uh, I am thrilled to present this program to you. Um, I realized after working with couples who were living with Parkinson disease, one person having it, actually in, in several couples, both people had Parkinson disease, which is really interesting. Um, I realized that there are so many people now, there are 20% of people in our country in the United States over the age of 60 are living alone. And if you're living alone with a chronic disease, that just magnifies all of the various different things that you have to think about. And so I thought it's really, really important to take this program and see what I can do to change it and make it for single people, people flying solo. I realized, so we've, uh, the, the grant was divided into three groups of people. Uh, we finished the first group in November. The next group starts next week. If you are interested, there is room available. And the third group will start in April. And I realized after the first group got going that there is almost no similarity between somebody who's living with another person who doesn't have Parkinson's, who can be their cheerleader, who can be their advocate at the doctor's office, who can walk the dog if you're off, who can make dinner or go shopping. Totally different when you are taking care of all of those things yourself. So this program has evolved and um, is really exciting to me in that the people in the program, it's called Help Yourself, but what has emerged is they're a community and they are helping one another. And as you will see, as I describe this program in detail, a support group is generated, whether you're currently in a support group or not. In this program, there is a support group that goes for the eight weeks of the program and then continues on. And we found in this first group, actually two people were having DBS surgery. Um, this group happened to be in the Philadelphia area. And a couple of people went to the rehab center after the surgery to say, hi, how are you? And bring them a, a plant. So we have been developing community with this program, which is very, very different from what people expected when they came into the program. Uh, I'm going to show you some slides and I may even do a little physical demo at the same time. Well, not at the same time. So, um, and Eden, you'll tell me if the slides are now showing. I can see them. Great. Okay. So uh, as I've said, I am uh, honored to be a Parkinson Foundation grantee. 
Penn Medicine is one of the centers of excellence for neurological diseases in general and Parkinson's disease in particular. And so I have an extraordinary team behind me. So this program is, is really covering everything you might have to know if you are living alone with PD. And whether you've just been diagnosed or you have been living with this disease for years, there are so many changes that happen, certainly physically, but in terms of your whole span of life. And so that's what we really want to tackle here. We're not going to solve every problem, but we are jumping into it. So this person's going to tell you a little bit about the program. Hello. My name is Judith Sachs, and I'm a teaching artist and Parkinson Foundation grantee, working this year in collaboration with Penn Medicine, Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center on a new grant, which is called Help Yourself, Living Alone with Parkinson's. We know that this disease is difficult enough if you have a partner along the, for the ride, but when you're living alone, you need new tips and techniques to negotiate the challenges of this movement disorder. And that's what Help Yourself, this eight week program is going to do for you. I'm in charge of the movement uh, piece of it and we'll be working on the activities of daily living. Everything from getting out of a chair, a bed, a car, a shower when you're slippery and wet to freezing of gait and falling, dealing with negotiating the floor when you are in control, how you get onto the floor and off of the floor, and then what to do after a fall, how to recover from it, and to deal with prevention for future falls. The second part of the program is the support group. You will be put into a support group and you'll have a buddy, somebody who was diagnosed prior to when you were diagnosed, somebody who can be with you along for the ride. And then the third piece is the education piece. We're going to have experts in everything from insurance, law, uh, financial matters. We're going to deal with um, meditation, end of life issues, home renovation. And all of that will be encompassed in this program, which we're offering to you. If you would like to register, please go to my website, www.anyonecanmove.com and sign up there, or you can speak with any of your providers at Penn Medicine, from your neurologist, your social worker, your physical therapist or occupational therapist. They'll have a flyer for you that will be included in your package. And I hope to see you in September. Thank you. So when I recorded that, uh, we were about to start in September. Don't worry about the date. So the first piece, moving. Uh, last time, I actually was the one teaching these various different strategies every week. And it was apparent to me and to everybody that somebody who does not have Parkinson's disease is going to do these things very, very differently from somebody who does. So now we have Deborah Mosley Duffy, who was diagnosed seven years ago. She's been a student of mine in dance classes, breathing classes, Qigong, you name it, um, and also has uh, been kind enough to say that she will be the teacher for these various techniques for the eight weeks that we are together. I think it is really interesting in that sometimes I will show her something I'd like her to try and she'll say, you know, that doesn't feel good to me. I'd rather do it this way. And the improvised nature of her movement, I think, has been uh, a big help to me as a teacher, and I think will be a big help to you as you take this course. So what are we going to do every week? <laughs> the first thing we're going to do actually is, you, is what I said in that little video, getting out of a chair and then moving forward from the chair, rolling in the bed, rolling on the wall and pretending it's the floor because it's easier to negotiate standing up and then uh, and i'm going to show you in a little bit how we get on the floor and get up. Um, certainly using the shower reaching for things in the kitchen 
negotiating the bathroom when it's dark at night. And I hope you all have a motion detector lights that turn on as you go from your bed. Um, that's all going to be a part of this program. The business of falling and the fear of falling. Uh, I will not promise you that anything in this program is going to stop you from falling. However, I can help you to gain a lot more confidence about what to do after a fall and how to prevent falls to begin with. So we certainly work on physical, uh, the ability to, to strengthen your ankles and your feet, the awareness of balance when you're standing, when you're seated and when you're moving, and also something about your vestibular nervous system. That's the uh, inner ear that makes you have vertigo or lack of balance. And we work on changing our visual field as we move to practice the idea of what happens when the body's out of control. We practice it while we're in control. Uh, breaking a freeze, we deal with that. We practice self-massage because it feels good. And it's also a way to loosen up some of the muscles that may get very tight and tense when you're thinking about moving. Uh, we uh, work with exercise balls. You get two free, anyone can dance purple balls. I think Eden has a bunch of them. <laughs> and the idea of all of this movement really is to develop confidence in solving new problems that may come up, maybe that will come up after you take this class. But because you will have learned the way to chunk up movement and to put pieces together in a very slow and determined way, you will probably be able to come up with some of these ideas on your own. So let me tell you a bit about the experts in this. Uh, by the way, the program is eight weeks. It's two hours uh, after in the afternoon. Uh, well, I have set it for Eastern Standard Time from 1 to 3. That would be uh, Pacific Time from 10 to 12. It is not two hours of a whole seminar. The idea is we get together, we chat a little bit, Mo's leads the exercise uh, portions of the day. We take a 15 minute break. And then one of these wonderful um, speakers comes and does a presentation. Weeks one and five are the support group where everybody gets together and can discuss a variety of different things. So uh, let me tell you about the experts. Uh, we have John Dean and Kate Erickson, who are, and, and you may know some of these people, uh, from YouTube or from uh, other lectures that they've given to the Parkinson community. They're all renowned in their field. Dean and Erickson deal with assistive technology. Uh, we are on Zoom, but there are so many new devices uh, and implements. You know, there's a whole section on Amazon for adaptive tools. And these people are going to be able to provide you with links and answer questions about particular problems you may be having in terms of technology. Rebecca Sternback, OTRL, is an occupational therapist who deals with rehab and home management. She works for a company called Jukebox Health. And Jukebox uh, is a national company, so it doesn't matter where you're living. They, will, they are ADA approved and they will come to your home for free and do an assessment of things that might make life a little bit easier for you, whether it's simply installing shower uh, uh, grab bars or if you want a flat surface in the bathroom so there are no ledges to step over, they can do that. A ramp into your house, they can do that. And they will make an assessment of what might be the safest and the best for you, and will do it at a reasonable cost. Julia Wood, OT, uh, she previously was dealing with cognition at Penn Medicine and now is working for the Alzheimer's Association. Um, she deals with cognitive changes in Parkinson's and Lewy bodies. And she's really fabulous in terms of picking apart what parts of this is, is depression, what part is loneliness, what part is fatigue, and comes up with some interesting tips and homework that you can do to challenge your brain. 
John Bauman, uh, again, he, he's kind of a YouTube star. And I met him uh, when I met Eden at the Parkinson, uh, at the PDM, uh, PMD Alliance meeting in October. He's just an extraordinarily positive man, uh, formerly a, a um, trial lawyer who's been living with Parkinson's for, I believe, 21 years and has some wonderful ways of projecting his optimism onto other people and also his very down to earth and realistic assessment of what kinds of things should be changed or can be changed as you move along on this journey. Ryan Adler, uh, Esquire Sela, is uh, a geriatric lawyer who uh, gives us advice about uh, financial legal matters, estate planning, will pre preparation, the hiring of a care manager if you need one. Uh, he's based in Philadelphia, but he has relationships with uh, legal firms in uh, many other states and would be able to facilitate uh, these documents for you. And Robin Hall, LCSW, is our meditation and mindfulness teacher. Uh, I've been studying mindfulness for decades, but Robin really put a new spin on it for me. She made it very doable, very practical, very down to earth, and something that I wanted to do daily. So these are the people you will have with you. And I'm going to stop sharing right now and just find out if there are any questions. Um, Eden, is there anything in the chat that we should be answering? Not yet, oh. um, but I'm sure as we continue, we will have questions, so. Okay, then I am, once again, I'm gonna go back uh, to sharing the screen. Oh dear, of course. <laughs> I, sh I acted too, too fast, guys, sorry. I do also um, just want you to clarify though, because I know this did come up in the flying solo group, that this does not replace other support groups. This just, absolutely. you become close with these people because you're going through this with them. Exactly true. Um, yes, it's, now I'm not sure why I can't get a full screen view. Are you seeing a full screen? No. Um, hmm. So slideshow. Right. Uh, hmm. Oh dear. Well, I don't want to take up your time with. Fiddling. Okay, but if you go to slideshow next to animations, will that do it? Transitions, animation, and the slideshow. I uh, I have something else at the top of my. Field. Just a minute. Uh, sorry, I apologize. This does not replace any other support group that you're in. The group that got together, um, as I said, they were from the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area and have been a, a little cohesive group together, but many of them belong to other support groups in their various states. And so if you are in the flying solo group, um, or any of the other uh, support groups, you you will stay there. You just make new friends and go through this experience together. All right, one second. Let me just see if I can do this again. Uh, hmm. There it is. Okay, that's the support group, and it will be. Hmm. It's going to be facilitated by Suzanne Reichwein, who is the head of social work at Penn Medicine. And it's going to meet twice over the course of the program. Uh, again, one of the interesting things about Zoom was that um, everybody could be in this support group, no matter where in the country they were. We're thinking about also having a hybrid group for our April group so that people who are around Penn Medicine may be able to physically get together, but that I don't know if that's going to happen. It also kind of depends on the COVID situation. But the point of the group really is to talk about what's going on with you today 
And what are the big picture items for the future? What kinds of things do you, are you looking forward to? What kinds of things are you anxious about? Uh, are you going to want to talk about how long should you be staying in your own home alone? Um, all of these things are being covered by this group. So one of our great innovations, I think, is the library. Uh, we have been recording every session, um, both the, the movement sessions and the expert sessions, not the support groups. Those are private. And then I've put them in on a Google Drive in our library, along with the various different handouts and the tips and suggestions from uh, not just the experts, but also from the participants. I mean, I thought it was it was interesting that somebody was talking about doing laundry in her house, and now she has two railings, one on either side of the stairs, and she needed a laundry basket that she could that had handles that she could go up and down the stairs holding while holding the railing. And somebody else came up with something at Walmart that cost three three dollars and that was lightweight and was useful in this particular way. So all of those tips and, and tricks are in the library. And as this new group begins next Tuesday, uh, we will be adding to the library and all of you who participate will have access to everything that's there. I always think that if you don't need this right now and you are either young onset or early onset, and you are really functioning very, very well on your own, Maybe you've lived alone all your life. Maybe you are recently divorced or widowed. Um, maybe you've just moved to a new area to be closer to children, but they are leading their own lives. If you don't need these ideas, that's wonderful. But the mind and the body really pick up these tips much, much better when you are feeling very strong, very functional, very, I want to do this immediately. Um, if in fact you don't need them now, you will be developing a kind of a muscle memory so that when you do need it, that will be something coming up for you in the future, that you'll have it somewhere in your body and your mind accessible to you. And of course, you can always go back to the library and look up what you don't remember. So I wanna talk a little bit about this. I didn't make this slide. <laughs> Uh, but I, I want to talk about balance and balance, of course, is a, a loaded word for us um, because sometimes you feel out of balance when you're just standing on your own two feet. The balance in life and in this particular chart, they've chopped it up so that every single one of these little buckets is equal. Well, right now for you, perhaps the physical takes up more than 50% and the pleasurable even after the holidays only takes up 2%. And maybe you want to switch some of these around. You want to make some bigger. You want to make some smaller. And that is one of the goals of this program is to see where are you putting your attention? Um, one of the things I think that has been very useful to me as a practitioner and teacher is that um, as we get older, we realize that there are certain things that were so, so important when we were 30 or 40, and we can really let them go right now. We can really concentrate on something else, but we're kind of dragged back in our mind to what used to be important. And so in this program, what we're really trying to do is figure out where do you have to put your attention first, and then we can move on to a few other things. I am hoping that all of you will develop more resilience as you age. So if you're living alone, you are actually two people, right? Um, this particular photo is not exactly what I wanted to find because <laughs> he's old and he's young and we are all that. But you are patient and you are care partner. And some days you're more one than the other. But both of them need respite. Both of them need some way to just relax a little bit and let the other person take over. Also, because you'll be in a group of others, 
sometimes you don't have to do everything for yourself. Um, one of the things that we want to encourage everyone to do, and you may all have this right now, is a team that's behind you. And I don't just mean your physician, your OT, your PT, your SP, and your social worker. I mean also those people in your life who are not your care partner, but perhaps, you know, the neighbor who has a dog who might just stop off and pick up the dog and pick up some groceries while they are at the supermarket or shovel the walk because their nephew came over and is shoveling their walk. Um, this is a very difficult piece of this program because many people who live alone have been independent, feel very independent and also feel a certain amount of either shame or discomfort asking others to help them. But this is the time without actually saying I need your help to start to collect people who might be open to the idea of sharing. I, one of the things that um, my close contact for couples did was to try and take the, the category of patient and care partner and just mess them up a little bit. So every exercise we did, the person who was called the patient would become the care partner. And the person who was the care partner would become the patient. And eventually they got rid of those titles and they just became collaborators. And that's ex exactly what we're trying to figure out here. How can we, as a group working in this program, help yourself, help one another, and how can we also get the help we need locally? Um, one of the gentlemen in my uh, this last group that ended in November, he has a Great Dane. Actually, he, he says, well, he's a good Dane. He's not a Great Dane. But uh, this, this dog came into his life when he had not been diagnosed. He's been diagnosed for four years and when his wife was still living and they really enjoyed having this big dog running around well now the dog is on his <laughs> front door uh, all the time and he was stuck by the fact that usually he goes to costco and he buys this gigantic bag of dog food you know they're i don't know 45 50 pounds and he is impeded by his Parkinson's disease and usually his housekeeper will come the day that he's bought the, the food and help him to lift it to dump it into the container where he's got a big scoop and then he can put the dog food into the bowl. On this particular day, the housekeeper was sick and there wasn't very much dog food left in the container. But he reached out to somebody on the block who whom he'd met on a variety of different dog walks. And that person came over and they did it together and they figured out how to lift and maneuver and use physics so that the two of them didn't hurt their back. And I thought this was ingenious planning. Uh, another woman in the group who uh, had been living in an abusive marriage this year uh, after being diagnosed eight years ago, this year she finally moved in with her daughter and son-in-law and their two children. And her daughter not only became pregnant again after she had moved in, but was diagnosed with breast cancer. And this woman said to me and to the group, there is absolutely no way I can take care of myself now. There's so much else to do. I have to be a grandmother. I have to be there with my daughter when she comes home from chemotherapy. I don't know how to take care of my Parkinson anymore. And the group was really not just empathic, but offered a variety of suggestions for respite so that she could have a little bit of help. There is There was another daughter who was in the vicinity. Um, they had really not leaned on her enough and they kind of apportioned the work so that she was finally able to take a couple of days by herself and do some good things for herself. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of a teamwork for this. So I think most of the people in this room, including myself, 
uh, are over the age that I said people are living alone, 60. And of course, aging all by itself requires a lot of thought and a lot of changes. Um, my feeling about this is that at other points in your life, before your diagnosis, before you got arthritis, you had a variety of difficulties in your life which you surmounted in one way or another. And so now you have a vantage point. You look back at those decades when you solved some problems. So I know everybody talks about, you know, golden years and silver sneakers and but I like to think of it where they do talk about people in their 40s and 50s as being in midlife. So now I'd like to say we are in high life. We are the top of the ladder. We are those who are in, 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 imbued with wisdom. And sometimes the wisdom isn't just for us, but can be for other people as well. So I'd like you to start thinking about that. And I also want you to start thinking about how positive it is that um, in the old days, uh, you had a clinical establishment of research, of your medical treatment with your uh, prescriptions, you had mental health services when you needed them, and they kind of sat on one side. And then you had the kind of human side where you'd go to your rock steady class or your dance for Parkinson class, where you would have a support group, where you would learn to uh, garden by standing up rather than kneeling. Um, what's I think happened in the last maybe five years, maybe the years since COVID, when telemedicine has sprung up, is that these two are now intertwined, that your neurologist is really interested in having you go to a dance class or a yoga class. And the research people are looking into the positive changes that happen to our brains when we are involved in the arts, when we come out of ourselves and help another person and support them. And these two things are now getting meshed together. And that kind of integration, I think, makes for improvement in healthcare. So I want to put you in the driver's seat. I think that it's time for you to begin teaching other people, uh, not just being an advocate for yourself, um, but to let others know that you're the one going through this, so you're the expert. So other people can come to you for advice, but probably only if you open up and let them know how expert you are and what you need. So that is uh, my presentation. Um, you can contact me at judithsacks at mac.com. You can go to anyonecanmove.com and get in touch with me. And I am um, also going to change the aspect of my screen so that I can do. First, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. We do have some logistics questions. Um, first, because you did talk about eight weeks and two hours. Um, so somebody was asking, is that five days a week or how many no, days no, 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 a week? No, sorry. Days? Sorry. Yes. So we are starting the new group of eight weeks. That's January the 10th, Tuesday, January 10th through Tuesday, February 28th. Once a week, we meet for two hours. I realize this is an enormous time commitment. If you cannot get there for all of this, we have a library and you will be able to look at the presentations that have been made. Um, the only thing that you won't be able to see is the support group. So week one, the, the nature of each of these sessions is we start at one o'clock my time, 10 o'clock, I think your time. Uh, we talk a little bit, introduce ourselves certainly in the first couple of weeks. Uh, talk about where we are in the country, how long we've been diagnosed, what our particular living situation is. And then for the next 45 minutes, Mose is going to lead a specific exercise. I don't like to really call it exercise. It's a movement segment that 
is all about activities of daily living. This has nothing to do with dance. It's all about the very practical method of using your body in space when you are alone to do it safely, efficiently, and I hope with some alacrity and joy. So that's the first piece. Then the second hour, which is an hour, is either the support group, which is weeks one and five, or the expert presentations the other six weeks. And, and those are helmed by the people um, I showed on the screen. I hope that that makes sense. If you cannot start next week, and I realized when, you know, when we were booking this time together, it was simply because of the holidays that I couldn't do this sooner. Um, I certainly understand if you, if you want to join this group and you can't start next week, maybe you can start the following week. Or you can start in April. We will go from April through May. Eden, does that? Yes. So just to clarify, on. that's going to be eight weeks starting on 110 for, uh, Tuesday. So you're going to meet every Tuesday for eight weeks, two hours. I put in the chat, that's going to be one to three Eastern. That will be 12 to uh, 10 two. to 12. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Uh, in uh, Central, 11 to 1 Mountain, and 10 to 12 in Pacific. And then um, somebody did ask, there is no cost for this program, correct? There is no cost. It is a Parkinson Foundation grant. And so what we're looking for is, is as many people as possible. The only thing I ask is that you complete an evaluation form before and then after. And there are two very, very short questionnaires, one of which has to do with mood and emotion. I think it's four questions. And one of which has to do with self-efficacy. In other words, how well are you doing X, Y, or Z? And that's eight questions. And then at the very end, I ask you, because the foundation loves to have testimonials. So if you had a wonderful time, terrific. If you did not, why? And I will give you a survey because, again, we're always looking to improve uh, where you can just say <clears throat> this part of it really worked for me. This part of it could be improved in the following way. As I've said to you, I am a big proponent of improvisation and I'm not stuck in any rigid way of doing things. And I think, again, because this is such a group effort and we're really trying to create a community, it's the it's what they used to call the hive brain we're really trying to get the ideas from everyone and what seems to happen is as one person comes up with an idea another person is generating an idea so they begin working together and collaborating on it kelly put in the chat um the, again no cost of the program you can sign up online and she put in the um address, but someone did ask, is there anything else they need to do to get started? Contact me. <laughs> <laughs> so either uh, Judith Sachs at Mac.com, or if you go to my website, there's a contact page and there's actually a page that deals with help yourself. And I think there's a button you can click saying, uh, I, I'm interested in registering. And, and that's all you have to do. I, I very much, um, hope that I will be able to send you the exercise balls. And if you don't get them in time, you can use tennis balls. If your dog has a ball, you can use your dog's ball. Um, but none of it is, yeah, you don't need a whole lot to sign up for this. And I feel um, that the, our last group was nine people and it was a very nice intimate group. Um, I'm actually hoping, especially because I know right now, I think we have nine signed up, that because they're from different parts of the country, um, different hospitals, different management systems, that there will be a lot of very interesting interchange about what's going on in their particular community. So I, I would, I just want to, before time gets short, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to demonstrate getting onto the floor and getting off of the floor. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I want to say that I am not a person with Parkinson. Um, and although I have two hip replacements, I really don't have any movement problems. But I want you to know that this sequence, which is probably one of the most important movement sequences we do, will be taught by a person with Parkinson disease. And so I am just, I'm just the messenger here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to change, oops, sorry. I'm going to change the aspect of my camera. The wonders of, uh, <laughs> the wonders of being in, in this big space. And <clears throat> I'm going to say that what we like to do here is to make people feel that it's possible to get from a chair onto the floor and back up again. And one of the ways we're going to do it is using your knees. Uh, as I said, I had hip surgery, but for people who have had knee surgery, but for most people anyway, we want to pad the way going down and going back. And typically I ask you to put down as many blankets or a mattress from your futon or whatever you're going to need to build up space. This is not built up in any way here. I'm actually, wait a minute, I'm going to get something bigger. So that when we first start, we have the idea that the knee wants to get as close to the ground, well now this ground is raised, as possible. So we just start in the chair aiming the knee for the mattress or the blankets. And then finally, and I'm just going to angle myself a little bit, finally what we do by supporting ourselves with our hands is just, as you see, I'm just slipping off. I'm opening this hip socket to get down toward the ground. And then after that, I can take this bigger piece away and I'm tucking this foot behind me. I want this as open as it can be. And I want to feel a lot of weight on my hands as I slide on the chair and I slide forward until finally when this knee hits, I actually can holding on to the chair, reach the floor, and get the other knee down. And then once I'm here, in this quadruped position, I can turn myself around, and I'm going to show you if this is, I'm going to show you a couple of different ways. Once I am on the floor, and again, we actually start all of this on a wall, so that we're kind of rolling around on a wall, but I just want to show you, once I'm on the floor, I think I'm still visible. <laughs> once I'm on the floor, I want to spend a lot of time in this, in this series, we do a lot of stuff with momentum and rocking. Because rocking takes our body in ways that we don't have to use any effort. And so as I rock on my hands and my rear end, I can get my knees toward the floor and just explore what it's like to be in the quadruped position and to be hands and feet position. And then if I am concerned about my body lying down on the floor, I can really do a body scan here and make sure that I feel comfortable before I begin to get up. At this point, again, I'm going to use the chair and I'm gonna back it up to something, actually. I, I, I don't wanna show that here because you won't see my body, but I wanna put it on a wall so that when I press into it, it's, it's against something that's not going to move. I'm gonna make sure that I'm on my hands and knees and get myself to a point where I can touch the chair. I can put my hand on the back of the chair put one foot up and then again begin this rocking process to propel myself up 
and into the chair. So, I'm going to change the camera again. Um, as I've said, right now that doesn't necessarily look like something you might want to do. But what we do is chunk everything up much smaller pieces uh, to get the idea that the floor is a safe place, a good place to be. It's very big. You're not going to bump into anything once you're there. And we want to try and normalize this whole experience of having the fall and where you land being it's not that it's going to take the fear and the <gasps> shock out of what happens when you go through a fall. However, once you are there, you will have these strategies in place to be able to help yourself to do this. So, um, which is really important because uh, Roger had said, you're all going to probably fall sooner or later. So it's important to learn how to fall and how to recover. So, yes. And, um, you know, when you watch your grandchildren in a playground or just kids in a playground and even crazy kids on their scooters who are a little older than that, when they fall, you if you watch what's going on, they they're almost boneless. There's a kind of a letting go and a, a surrender to the ground. And that's the kind of thing that I want to engender in people of our age and people with Parkinson's disease, that the less you tense up and the more you simply feel I'm going with this. And when I get there, I will figure out how to get up. Um, it's, it's very difficult and requires practice. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is um, in these movement techniques, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing mind shattering about them. It's sort of that we have broken down everything into its most basic elements. However, if you are not used to moving this way, you're probably moving in a way that's really unconscious. And that may be based in whether you're on or off, whether you freeze, uh, what the landscape is like if you're in a familiar place or an unfamiliar place, if you're indoors or outdoors, if you're on an uneven surface, like you've got cement on one side and grass on another. What I want to do is, is make you really, really conscious of what your body is doing and what it can do and what you probably don't want it to do. And in these lessons, it's only once a week. And so I ask if you would each week, go back to the, the videotape, or if you remember it, you don't need to watch the video and go through these exercises on your own. Uh, again, we're gonna have handouts. We're gonna have uh, all the instructions available for you. You don't have to remember anything, but practice does not make perfect. Practice makes self-confidence because each time you do it, you discover something about the way that you do it or your attitude toward it or what you might improvise within it to make it easier for you. So those are the, the basic pieces of the program. Any questions? Ask me anything. Do you have a couple other questions? Someone asked if... Um... In future, would it be on a different day, not on Tuesdays? I don't, I, I have no idea. Okay. So maybe, maybe right. not. We don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. These, these two bunches, um, again, it's been very tough to schedule, especially mm -hmm. because people are now so busy and they live in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been trying to get my experts who are who are leading their own busy professional lives involved. So at the moment, it's Tuesdays at this time. Okay. And then one question that's come up several times is what happens if you're not truly flying solo? Um, I know I have one person in my flying solo group 
who, yes, she's married, but she says her husband doesn't take an active role in her caregiving. I had a few personal people asking me, well, what if you're not really flying solo, but what can you tell us about that as far as this group for people? So initially I, I thought I'm going to just restrict it. You have to be living alone. And now I don't feel that way at all. I, I think that again, uh, in many situations, either there is a spouse who is not particularly um, helpful or is at work every day or travels a lot or an adult child who maybe will come in, but maybe won't. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, contact me if you aren't interested, let me know what your situation is and we'll work it out together. And my, I think now what I feel is if, if you feel alone, like more than 50% of the time, then this program's for you. Perfect. And so that answered most of the questions. Does anybody have anything else? Because um, like I said, that was a big question that several people asked if, if the spouse works or this. So it is nice to know that Yes, because technically, even if you don't live alone, that doesn't mean you always have support um, readily available, If especially if you are left alone for long periods of time and you're working with things like falling, which, you know, I mean, it's funny when you said how children can go boneless, because that's what I think about when you try to lift up a child and they don't want to be lifted up and they do, <laughs> yeah, and they just make it impossible. Yeah. And I thought, you know, as an adult, I don't really know if we could just kind of go down with the same, um, you know, freedom that like a child's just like, yeah, I fell. And in part, cause they, I remember I'm in my head, I'm going, yeah, but I was shorter then. So it was a lot easier to get to the ground. I didn't have to fall as fast, uh, you know, for as long. Um, I'm just gonna, I, I wanna answer. I just looked at the chat here. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say, yes, we, we will also be dealing with how to fall. And the idea of first sitting on a bed and falling and then kneeling on a bed and falling. And then what I suggest is slithering down a wall so that again, you have the sense of gravity is here and then gravity is no longer here. And how do you control that? And I just wanna mention that somebody said, we don't expect our spouse to be a house housemaid or a house aide. And, and no, of course, um, that's not what marriage is all about, but um, there are certain people whose spouses are really not going to be helpful in a situation where you need help. And that's what I'm really more talking about, that if you feel alone, and I think all of us have now had the experience of, for the last three years, what it really means to be alone, if you are, I, I am, um, because it's very different from uh, being in society, being going out to work or being with people all the time. And it, it has become since I think since the pandemic, a lot more um, present in the minds of people with a chronic disease. What is it going to be like when I'm when I'm 80 or 90, etc. If I decide I want to stay alone. So those are all the questions that we're kind of playing around. I mean, there's no there's no one answer. But the questions that we are dealing with and Sometimes people will say, I'm hoping my spouse kicks in after I need them. And other people say, I know that she or he won't. But I mean, I, I, I do, I see both sides of this. Cause like, I know from my flying solo group, when you don't have somebody, one of our members for example, she just broke a wrist. It had nothing to do with her Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And it was just suddenly like, well, how do you wash your hair when you break your wrist? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Who is doing these things for you? Um, I absolutely loved that kind of, um, you didn't really put it as a list, but for it to encourage people to think about who would help me with these yes. things, you know, who of my friends like already has a dog and would help me walk mine. Um, I joke because I can't cook. So I am not the person you'd want to bring you a meal unless it was takeout, but <laughs> I am the person who would clean your bathroom. If you're like, hey, bathroom's getting kind of gross, kitchen's getting kind of gross, I'm like, I will come and clean that and I'm happy to do so. 
So it's oh. kind of like thinking about that in your head, having that, who would help me with these things if something, again, doesn't have to be catastrophic, but just, you know, if you yeah. twist an ankle and, and all of a sudden you can't walk your dog anymore, or you can't stand for long periods of time, who is helping with these things? So I think the other thing is that as we all age, we just don't know what's around the corner. I mean, everything about this disease is unpredictable and everything about aging is unpredictable. And we, we don't know that even if we are partnered right now, that we will continue to be partnered over the next few decades. So the idea of starting to think of not that I have to do it myself, but that there may be uh, different ways of approaching uh, the necessities of life you know, the ways that we really care for ourselves and that may project to the others in, in this group. So I'm, I'm hoping that you will reach out to me and um, I would be delighted to meet you. Well, I see we have several people that have already said they've either signed up or they're going to sign up, so. Great. Thank you so much for your time. As always, I always love to see you. <laughs> I was so happy to see you today. Thank you. Thank you to PMD Alliance. It is a fabulous, enormous group, and I am thrilled to be part of it. And thank you all for coming today. Thank you. I do also want to remind everybody, if you'd like to save your chat, because there was some information put in the chat, if you click on those three little dots next to the smiley face, you can save your chat. And of course, we always at PMD Alliance, we have our tradition where we do our wave of gratitude because we're so grateful when our speakers come and give us their time today. And Judith is actually going to give us more than that because she's got a whole course that's being launched. So I really hope everybody joins up, registers, and that starts next Tuesday at the 10th. Thank you. Thank you.